next up, we've got Carrie Newman and Brad Petruska. Carrie has forgotten everything he learned before he turned 30, but has learned a lot more since then, especially about fire management, planning, and analysis. He works in the San Juan National Forest in southwest Colorado and has interest in geospatial fire analysis, the application of that, and interpretation of that. He likes to make use of his knowledge of it when he goes on fires, and he also teaches 495, which is the geospatial fire modeling course. And he's learned that there's a lot of people that like the same things he does, and he likes learning more with those people. He's co-presenting today with Brad. Brad Petruska is a fire planner and fuels program manager for BLM in southwest Colorado. His interests are in fire behavior and fire danger and how to effectively use and interpret those systems to make better decisions. He's an FN and L10 on Rocky Mountain Blue Team and spends as much time as he can in the San Juan Mountains or on the rivers that flow out of them. Today, Brad and Terry will talk about their perspectives on how risk management influenced decision making on the 416 fire in Colorado this past summer. Thank you, Tanya, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Brad and I think we have a pretty good story to tell about the 416 fire and what we learned, so without any further ado, we'll get started. So what we're looking at here is the pocket card applicable to the 416 fire along with the fire business indices for June 1st, 2008. And both of these products were developed by Brad. Uh, we're showing them to illustrate how the potential for large fire growth had developed in the area over the past months and to illustrate that we had a plan that we were following. So we'll come back to these. The graph you're looking at from the Natural Resource Conservation Service shows the annual precipitation summary for the water year for the river basins in southwest Colorado based on snow tail data as of June 6, 2008. The purple line shows the 30-year average annual precip, and the green line shows the average year-to-date precip as of June 6. Uh, you can see that the previous two water years in 2017 and 16 were about average, and 2015 was slightly below average. Um, they were all fairly uneventful fire seasons. By the end of May 2018, the Four Corners area had been in a precipitation deficit since the previous fall. What meager snowpack there was, which is only about 50% of average, peaked by late March and then melted off rapidly. Uh, South-facing slopes below about 9,000 feet were mostly snow-free all winter. The good crop of grass that was produced the previous summer in 2017 saw little, if any, compaction and was standing up and waving at us. By the beginning of June 2018, the year-to-date precip was less than 50% of average. By the end of May, the U.S. Drought Monitor was indicating that the Four Corners area was in exceptional drought, the image on the left. By comparing the image on the right, is, is from the same period in 2002 and was eerily similar. 2002 was the year of the Missionary Ridge Fire, which to date is still the largest and most destructive wildfire in southwest Colorado. In the weeks leading up to the 416 fire, we had been wondering if 2018 was going to be like 2002. So back to our plan. If 2018 was going to be another 2002, we were going to be ready for it. This was potentially the fire season that we were going to be able to test out and validate our revised fire danger operating plan. The previous two years had been rather uneventful with only brief periods above the third levels. By the 1st of June 2018, the levels have been elevated above four since the middle of May. The response level indicated the number and types of resources that were needed to meet the response plan, and resources had been ordered in and staged on support codes as the preparedness level escalated, and also based on forecast. A national prevention team had been in place since April 27th, and the zone had been in stage one fire restrictions since May 1st. The wildfire potential and wildfire prevention message was out far and wide is the zone prepared to move to stage two fire restrictions on June 1st. And resources were available in the event that, the wildfire, that a wildfire ignited in spite of prevention efforts. 
Now we want to make the theme of this presentation about risk versus probability of success and how trade-offs can influence strategy. So I'm going to turn it over to Brad. And he's going to give you a, a primer on risk perception. Brad? Thanks, Gary. Hey, everybody. It's Brad here. Uh, we're going to go for a little detour that we'll circle back around to later. So imagine there's a 2% risk for men to spontaneously combust and a 1% risk for women to spontaneously combust. We perceive that risk as being double for men versus women. Now let's change it a little bit. Imagine there's 32% chance for that to happen to men and 33% chance to happen to women. We see that about the same exact risk, even though it's the same increase in risk that's out there. A recurring theme in fire management and in decision support tools is the use of probabilities. Uh, the point of the comic here is just illustrating the gambler's fallacy, showing again that a, a small risks are still small and that humans have kind of a difficult time framing that correctly. Uh, the gambler's fallacy was named that because in 1913 at the Monte Carlo Casino, a roulette ball fell on black 26 times in a row, which is 1 in 66.6 .6 million to 1 odds, and people lost millions betting against black. So this crowd's a little different than most others, and I'm not going to quiz you on the following few slides how you answered, but take a few seconds and just answer in your head. Okay, so here's one example. You've got two lotteries to win 250 bucks. One offers a 5% chance to win, and the other offers a 30% chance to win. So what we're doing here is just choosing from below of what seems like a more significant change. You can improve the chances of winning in the first one from 5 to 10%, or you can improve the chances of winning in the second one from 30 to 35%. So with this audience and betting, we all understand the difference between these two statements is not actually a difference. The changes are the same. If the question was to pick between one or the other, we'd all pick the 35% one in this basic comparison. But the point is that most people, 75% actually, view low probabilities and the increase in those as much greater than they actually are, and higher probabilities as much lower than they actually are. I don't have any reason so far to doubt this happens in fire management as well. All right, so a few more examples real quick. You are debating comprehensive insurance for your paid off car that's worth 10 grand. The odds of you being in an accident are about 1%. The difference in the deductible is $150. Would you buy the comprehensive coverage? One, two, answer. So the way we can actually calculate this stuff is through expected utility. We just multiply the odds by the value and get $100 is the actual cost of the risk. The difference being $150 is the difference. So most people uh, are not wholly rational, and they don't accept that risk. I know I've been in situations before where I've bought insurance I don't need, so it's just showing our tendencies to overvalue low probability events. Next one, you can either have 100% probability of winning $47,000 or enter a lottery with a 95% chance of winning $50,000. Which one would you choose? Really quick. All right, I know what I'd do. I would take the easy $47,000. But the point of this slide is that we undervalue high probability and show our fear of disappointment. So the expected value of the 95% chance is actually higher than the easy $47,000. These are just some pretty basic examples there. Um, but it leads us to the broader point, the how people perceive uncertainty. This one, this table is a little wordy, but has some more of those word problems and then um, as well as how people usually answer those if they're not in sitting there with a paper and a pen or a calculator or anything. Our behavior is basically the same when we're faced with a high probability of a gain or a low probability of a loss. We're risk averse under both of those situations. We're hoping to either minimize our fear of disappointment or minimize our fear of a large loss. The inverse is true when we're faced with a low probability of gains or a high probability of losses. A high probability of losses, interestingly, is how we're generally framing things on fires. Under those situations, people usually become risk-seeking, hoping to avoid a large loss. Um, on fires, we're really very rightly concerned with the negative aspects that can result from them, but the concern has unintended consequence of making us seek more risk than what's necessary. Decision makers tend to frame collective decisions in individual terms, so the strange rationalizations that you see here also seem to apply on most fires. 
You guys probably know a lot of this stuff from prospect theory that was created in 79 by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, Kahneman, who was still alive, was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for the theory. Um, from my perspective, all this stuff, we see it every single fire season. So we seek risk when outcomes are framed as losses. Go ahead over there, Gary. Um, Right, we frame stuff as in probability of success. So we've got a low probability of success. Well, we should at least try. What's the worst that can happen? And then we are risk averse when outcomes are framed as gains. So there's an 80% chance the fire will stay in the wilderness. Ooh, I don't like that that much. Regardless of how we feel about risk, the fact is that some fires every year will have high expected losses from ignition, and we can't do much about it during the initial response time frame. So before Kahneman and Tversky made this theory, people assumed that humans made rational decisions called expected utility. The issue is that we don't. They showed that. And real-life decision-making in wildfire is actually a series of decisions in a very compressed time frame with limited information available that isn't probabilistic in nature. Uh, Carrie just clicked there. You can see here's FS Pro color bands on top of what's called the probability weighting function. So that straight line is the actual probability, right? 50% probability is a coin flip. The red line is how people generally perceive those probabilities, and then overlaid on there is the FS Pro color bands as they're standardly shown. So what this is showing us um, is that about 20 to 70 percent in there, people are viewing that as essentially flat right there at about 35 percent. So really four out of the seven color bands in an FS Pro are basically being perceived as the same thing with the attention being given to the outliers of the dark blue, the pink, and the red. So if we go ahead and apply that to an FS Pro, which is on the next one there. So here's our standard FS Pro, standard color bins. The, one, the next one here is probably what people are actually perceiving. All I did on this was rescale the color bands to that probability weighting function. And uh, same exact model, same validity of both results. You can see the, the legend there has the actual bins of it now. Um, again, people perceive moderate probabilities as roughly the same as around 35%. So those middle color bands, the yellow, green, and uh, orange to some extent, are a little bit shrunken, basically because people don't see the difference there. These are all just decides on how best to interpret probabilistic information to others. We didn't do this on the 416 fire, and I bet all of you guys have a lot better uses of your time on fires than to dink with the color banding. But I hope it does help paint the picture that we're speaking to others about probability isn't absorbed the way that we want it to because of human nature. So one more click here and we'll just show uh, humans deal a lot better with odds than we do with probabilities. So here's just one thought, maybe just make it qualitative and give them you know, extreme, very high, high, moderate, and low. Maybe that'll help them somehow. Anyway, we're gonna get back on track and talk about this stuff with the 416. So on 416, overall, uh, started June 1st at 10.02 on an east aspect. Uh, you could look right across the road in the valley and see the Missionary Ridge fire. The fuels, terrain, and valleys were all about identical on these two fires. As we saw on a previous slide, we were in uh, D4 drought, and it was the earliest onset in history. And pretty much everyone realized from the start that there was going to be some high losses to be expected from this thing. Um, that's that's taken us back to the prospect theory stuff, the certainty effect, where generally humans will be risk-seeking. So what we're really going to focus on is what do we feel was different in 2018 that led to a different outcome than we could see right across the valley with the Missionary Ridge fire. So going to the next one, uh, the challenges. A lot of structures right around the fire. 3,300 roughly threatened at the peak from the 209, uh, 1,700 roughly within a mile of the final perimeter. There were huge economic impacts associated with the closure of Highway 550 and the Durango Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, which really led to a 15% loss of the local tourist-based economy in the critical months of June and July. Uh, the video, if it's going to work, which I don't know if it will, is going to show some of the concerns with smoke impacts that would arise there. Um, this is just an early, early time-lapse video of the 416, and you can see the smoke is moving to the south right down towards the city of Durango there in the Animas River Valley. Valley. These smoke impacts were really bad through the whole thing. And then the last one to top it off, we were hit uh, uh, by an anomalous tropical moisture event post-tropical depression bud right in the middle of June, which is our peak fire season. 
So that's kind of the, the setup here on risk, and we're going to turn it back to Carrie for a little chronology. Okay, so uh, the fire, 416 fire was reported to Durango Dispatch Center at 10.02 on June 1st, 2008. On the west side of U.S. Highway 550, about 12 miles north of Durango, Colorado, and about three miles north of the town of Hermosa, Colorado. Within an hour, a Type 3 incident command had been established, and numerous resources were either responding or on scene, including a Type 1 and a Type 2 IA crew, a wildland fire module, a Type 3 and, a type, and two Type 6 engines, plus miscellaneous single resources, including eight smoke jumpers. Within two hours, aerial supervision had been established, and, the, and seats and large air tankers and a Type 2 and Type 1 helicopter were all working the fire. We had a plan, and we were following it. U.S. Highway 550 corridor north from Durango to Purgatory, uh, the ski resort up there, is populated with many residences, along with resort and vacation properties, numerous businesses, and recreation opportunities. U.S. Hi Highway 550, also known as the Million Dollar Highway, is not only the primary transportation route between Durango and the mountain town of Silverton, but it's also one of the most scenic drives in North America and is a very popular year-round tourist attraction. The Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, also a very popular tourist attraction and economic engine to the local economy, runs adjacent to Highway 550 north of Durango for about 14 miles before it joins the Animas River north of Silverton. Under the influence of southwest winds turning up valley in the Animas River Canyon and slope, the 416 fire spread laterally and upslope towards the ridge between the Animus River to the east and Hermosa Creek to the west. At times, as the column leaned across Highway 550, spots were thrown across the highway but were quickly extinguished. The tactical priorities were, number one, keep the fire west of Highway 550, two, structure protection, and three, direct attack. Ground resources focused on the heel of the fire and progressed slowly up the left flank above Highway 550. By 1400, mandatory evacuations were in effect along both sides of Highway 550 from Baker's Bridge to Elector Lake, and Highway 550 was closed from Trimble Lane on the south to Purgatory on the north. Resources continued to arrive on scene and more were on order. With regards to aviation use, the incident commander realized quickly how ineffective unsupported tanker drops would be after a VLAT load at coverage level 8 burned all the way through within 20 minutes. Air priorities were shifted to where they would be supported by ground resources, which in and of itself, itself is a rare event on a rapidly emerging initial response. By the end of June 1st, the fire had become well established along the ridge and it progressed laterally to the north along Hermosa Cliffs while burning downslope almost to the highway. Direct containment had been effected on the west side of and adjacent to the highway a short distance up the left flank. No structures were lost. Evacuations were in effect and the highway was closed to all except emergency responders and law enforcement. The Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad was stranded in Silverton along with its passengers until arrangements could be made to evacuate the passengers back down to Durango or back to Durango via another route. The Type 2 incident management team was on order and the local Type 3 incident management team would take command of the fire at midnight until the Type 2 team could transition in a couple of days. Once the fire reached the top of the ridge, it became very clear that any opportunities to prevent further spread to the west into the Hermosa Creek watershed would come with huge logistical challenges and a high degree of risk. The watershed itself is vast and remote with virtually no barriers to spread to the west until the fire reaches the western divide between the Animas and Dolores River watersheds, and even then the effort to stop the fire there would be massive. To the north, the earliest opportunity to stop the fire would be in the parks of the East Fork of Hermosa Creek to the west of Purgatory, and beyond that would be the high barren peaks of the San Juans. To the south, there were no barriers to spread before the fire reached the town of Hermosa. 
to the southwest, the first opportunity was the Junction Creek Road that winds its way up the ridge to the high peaks of the La Platas. Agency administrators were in agreement that within the Hermosa Creek watershed, the primary values to be protected, if possible, were a few range cabins and two populations of rare lineage cutthroat trout. The probability of successfully holding the fire along the east ridge of the watershed was low to non-existent, and the risk of trying to do so was too great. A hastily published decision in WIFTAS late on June 1st only had three incident objectives. One, weigh the, risks, weigh the risk versus the probability of success for all actions. When the probability of success is high, protect private property and infrastructure. And when the probability of sex, success is high, keep the fire west of Highway 550. It was well understood by all that the 416 fire was going to be a long duration event and that strategic planning was necessary to reach a successful outcome. The strategic planning team was being assembled to work with the incident management team consisting of a SOPL, an L10, and a WIFTAS editor. They were tasked with developing a strategic plan that could be incorporated into a new WIFTAS decision. A risk management assistance team had also been ordered to assist the agency administrators in providing direction to the incident management team. So where we left off on June 1st, by the end of June 2nd, the fire had become well established on the top of the ridge and had begun to back down into Hermosa Creek in several locations. The fire also continued its lateral movement to the north along the Hermosa Cliffs. Brad? All right, thanks. So June 3rd, Rocky Mountain Blue Team Type 2 IMT assumed command at 0600. Our operational priorities were in line with the rough wolf objectives and pretty much a continuation of the Type 3 team's effort to go direct up the south flank in Division A. Uh, 9.30, I hopped on a helicopter with the operations section chief to recon specifically that south end, especially after some of those objectives Carrie just read out. The weather forecast on June 3rd was overcast with 40% chance of precip returning to hot and dry within the following two days. So there was a really short window of reduced fire behavior and um, a really short window for any success using the direct tactics. Two hotshot crews were already shuttled up and ready to continue their line construction effort by the time we were in the air, and they felt really good about their chances of getting to the ridge. The problem wasn't getting to the ridge, it was on the backside. So that right picture there, you can see how it's already over the top. Um, fire had already established firmly on the west aspect in dense gamble oak and require, would require about four miles of underslung line in an area with no roads with two days until critical conditions returned with only two hot shots currently in place and others trickling in and we had two assigned helicopters and it was group torching and overcast skies at 930. So really those are the only things we knew on June 3rd when we went to recon. The fire was going to pick up again. It was an exceptional drought year and to go direct would require more resources than we had and potentially more risk than we were willing to let others take on, knowing that their probability of success was really low from our viewpoint. So after we talked about it on the flight, the ops section chief made the call to pull the resources from their direct line mission, essentially changing the course of the whole fire after one early morning flight. So going back and kind of verifying inputs what we had available at the time to us, uh, we did look at estimated ground evacuation. It was a great starting point, but it's missing some uh, key intel. So you can see the arrow is pointing to an area that's uh, less than an hour ground evac because it thinks there's a road there. That's actually a severely rough ATV trail that Forest Service firefighters had rolled ATVs on before. Um, as you get a little further towards US 550, you can't walk there because there's actually 1,000 to 2,000 vertical foot cliffs everywhere. Um, outside of that, it was really reasonable everywhere else. So if you accept the model did a reasonable enough job with what was given, then tack on the cliffs and lack of roads, it would probably have taken between four and six hours at a minimum to pack anyone out who got injured from the top of the ridge down to definitive care. For what was at risk on the west side, which was primarily resource objectives and uh, values, I don't think anybody questioned the trade-off once it was explained. So there on June 3rd, uh, after going on that flight, everybody was kind of of the mindset that this would be a long duration fire that would get quite large. Uh, the IC directed the operations section and myself to make what we call PACE lines within 24 hours. Uh, PACE, if you don't know, stands for Primary Alternate Contingency and Emergency. It's a pretty basic form of strategic planning that initially I didn't see a huge amount of value in, but I think my perspective got shifted on this a little bit here. Uh, the blue one is the primary, 
green is alternate, yellow contingency, and red emergency. So what you'll see looking at this map is that really none of the lines connect to themselves. So there wasn't ever a set plan to be able to box this thing in. Uh, the strategy really shifted on June 3rd to a delay as much as possible to avoid impacts to values thing. So I said earlier I didn't, you know, buy into the pace stuff enough or a lot at the time. But really what it did do was create a great common operating strategic picture for the incident management team, the agency administrators, the forest, and the cooperators to where we all saw the best places to delay the fire. Um, for a pretty hastily drawn product, really early in the incident, the pace lines for the most part were played out through all the teams that managed the fire. While we didn't know exactly where the control lines would be put, future recons with ops styled in that plan, specifically between the green and yellow lines south of Hermosa. The lines weren't intended to be final stopping places for the fire, but rather what we saw is the best available existing features to find opportunities from in the future. So pace lines, right, generally a wag to draw so early on when you're not fully calibrated to what the fire is going to be doing. But in this case, I had a lot of help. So when I go into WUFDIS, and if you guys ever do and you see, you know, Rick Stratton or Chuck McHugh or Tanya or anybody kind of dinking around in there, I generally expect RMAT, that acronym, to start coming up quickly. Um, this is a, a visual of what's called potential control locations. So really it just judges the landscape against itself to figure out where the most likely spots for a fire to be controlled are. Um, I got lucky on the 416 fire. I was able to get this data from Kit O'Connor at Rocky Mountain Research Station on June 3rd, pretty much as soon as I got off that recon. Uh, this layer helped a lot for drawing the pace lines through some areas, and they were generally drawn at the best places to stop or delay the fire. The PCL further backed up the the inference that Travis and I had as far as on the ridge line, our probability of success, uh, fairly low looking at the, the potential control locations. So uh, some perspectives from other, from the district ranger, the pace map was a little alarming at first, but helped him get a better picture of how large and long duration uh, the incident management team expected the fire to go. Seeing this stuff early in the incident helped frame all future decisions that he would have to make. And the pace lines were also verified by the local FMO, who was the IC during initial attack. He said something to the effect of, this thing's going to burn all along Falls Creek to the south towards Durango. It'll probably hit Purgatory, and if it goes any further north, no one's going to be chasing it anyway because it's going to hit rock. So it really helped build our common operating picture early on. Back over to Kerry. Thanks, Brad. We'll go back to where we left off on June 2nd. So the passage of a low pressure system on June 3rd dampened fire behavior for a couple of days, but the 416 fire received only a couple hundredths of an inch of precip and not on all areas of the fire. High pressure began to back, build back in on June 4th and the fire behavior picked up back to levels previously seen. Highway 550 had been reopened to es escorted traffic from 1030 to 1800 on June 3rd. By the end of June 6, the fire continued to spread to the west and down to, towards Hermosa Creek and had nearly reached the Hermosa Creek Road, which was being prepped for holding. Spread continued to the south and along the, both sides of the ridge where it was just a matter of time before the fire posed a direct threat to Hermosa. With the abandonment of direct tactics, uh, or direct line construction up to the ridge, on the east, the tactic became one of indirect firing along the railroad track and walking the fire south as the fire backed down the slope. The fire continued its lateral movement to the north along the east slopes of Hermosa Cliffs, but spread had slowed as the fire moved through the rocky cliffs and patches of Aspen. A Type 1 incident management team had been ordered on June 6th. So Brad mentioned RMAT earlier and a risk management assistance team had been ordered by the regional forester for the 416 fire. You may have heard RMAT being referred to as just another team that comes to the incident with the intention of influencing outcomes. What RMAT can really be thought of is a process whereby a team of subject matter experts provides assistance to agency administrators and incident management teams in the management of risk. The team is comprised of line officers experienced in wildfire management and incident management team members highly qualified in operations and risk management slash safety. 
They're backed up by a host of analysts who provide a number of tools to support the alignment of management direction to the incident ob objectives. We could spend the rest of our time here introducing and explaining all of the analytical products that RMAT brings into the discussion of meeting incident objectives. But in the interest of time, I'll only mention that RMAT presented two trade-off analyses on June 7th, which traders, fire staff, and the current and incoming incident management teams. So here we're looking at uh, examples of those alternative courses of action. Uh, the, to the south, the first course of action analyzed was the current one, which looked at keeping the fire to the east of the Hermosa Creek Road and by firing a couple of sections of hand line built up to the cliffs above Hermosa and keeping the fire from imminently impacting Hermosa. The second alternative was similar to the first but looked at firing off a series of hand lines, dozer lines, and subdivision roads much closer into the structures. The third alternative expanded on the second one to the south and protecting structures along the Falls Creek Road and proposed containing fire spread to the south towards Durango by using indirect fire lines along the Junction Creek or 171 Road as we'll refer to it. Three, al three more alternatives were analyzed to the north to keep the fire from impacting Purgatory Resort and values along Highway 550. Each of the alternative examined values to be protected and the likelihood that they would be impacted, along with the associated risk to firefighters. The probability of success and the consequence of failure was also assessed for each alternative. So the June 1st evacuations were still in effect. On June 7th, mandatory evacuation orders were ordered for another large area, including the town of Hermosa at 0600. Handline construction was completed up to the cliffs above Hermosa from the Hermosa Creek Road on the west and from the railroad tracks up to the cliffs on the east. Firing out first along the west hand line up to the cliffs at dusk, it began at dusk while fire, uh, firing progressed down the Hermosa Creek Road bringing fire together at the west hand line. Firing the east hand line began shortly after sundown and initially secured the Hermosa Triangle. Pretty successful day. So going back to 2002 and looking at the progression of the Missionary Ridge Fire, we can see that while there were some large spread days to the south, along the east side of the Animus Valley and terrain similar to the terrain to the south of the 416 fire, spread occurred in smaller increments than against the predominant winds. If the 416 fire were to get established on the west side of Hermosa Creek, we could expect a similar progression to occur. But there might be hope. Looking out 10 days, the Climate Prediction Center's 6 to 10 day outlook on June 6th was calling for chances of above normal precipitation in the Four Corners area related to moisture from the Eastern Pacific, as specific as it was. By the end of the June 8th, burnout had been completed along the railroad tracks along the east side, but the fire hooked around the north end of Hermosa Creek Road and crossed Hermosa Creek. The door to the south was cracked open and the game was on to protect the High Meadow and Falls Creek subdivisions and to stop the fire along the 171 road more than five miles to the south. On the north, the fire was becoming well established on the ridge above Hermosa Cliffs and beginning to move to the northwest and down into the Hermosa Creek drainage. In anticipation of the fire crossing Hermosa Creek, construction of indirect line had been progressing from Hermosa Creek Road and across Trip Gulch and over to the Falls Creek Road. Hints of moisture out seven days were appearing in the forecast. Back to the pocket card. We are approaching 2002 levels. Missionary Ridge Fire is noted prominently on the pocket card and started on June 9th, 2002. The Rocky Mountain Type 1 Incident Management Team assumed command of the fire on June 9th. 
A red flag warning was posted for June 9th and 10th with increasing southwest winds ahead of a Pacific storm crossing the northern Rockies. The fire almost doubles in size in one burned period, and the door to the south swings wide open. Mandatory evacuations were ordered for Falls Creek Ranch and High Meadow subdivisions on June 9th at 1330. The fire is also poised in alignment to purgatory. Movement laterally to the north along Hermosa Cliffs virtually stops due to shading from smoke and less receptive fuels. By the end of June 11th, the door to the south has swung wide open and the fire has spread south across Buck Creek. And burnouts from Hermosa Creek Road up to Trip Gulch were successful and no structures were lost. Line construction to protect structures to the south along Falls Creek Road continues and a combination of hand line and dozer line has been co completed that connects uh, the uh, Falls Creek Road to the 171 Road. Line construction north along Highway 550 is completed in anticipation of burnout operations in the upper Hermosa Creek at Purgato and Purgatory if necessary. Mandatory evacuations are still in effect from Falls Creek on the south to Elector Lake on the north. On June 10th at 945, mandatory evacuations are ordered from Elector Lake to Cascade Village, and Purgatory is evacuated and closes down summer activities. Nowadays, like most ski areas, Purgatory is open year-round and offers fun activities during the summer. It has daily lift-serve mountain bikes and roller slides, and the Music in the Mountains Concert Orchestra Series is also a big draw. The closing of Purgatory due to the 416 fire was yet another impact to the local economy. By the end of June 13th, the fire spread south to the ridge above Falls Creek. Burnout and holding along the Falls Creek Road had been successful, and no structures have been lost. The remnants of Hurricane Bud are forecast to impact the area in three days. In anticipation of Bud, the tactic is to use aircraft to keep the fire on the ridge and keep it from moving down into Falls Creek. To the north along Highway 550 and the Hermosa Cliffs, there's been little movement, but the fire continues to move up Hermosa Creek drainages towards Purgatory. Bud moves into the area on, overnight on June 15th. Rain begins falling on the morning of June 16th and continues through June 17th. Up to 1.5 inches of precip are recorded at incident IROs and local RAW stations. The decision is made to begin construction of direct fire line in Division Delta from Falls Creek Road up along the edge on the north side of Falls Creek to the 171 road, and that decision was made on June 17th. An EMO team is ordered on June 18th. All evacuations have been lifted by June 19th, and direct fire line construction in Division Delta from Falls Creek Road up along the ridge on the north side of Falls Creek to the 171 road is completed on June 20th. Brad? Having a post-tropical depression hit southwest Colorado in an exceptional drought year hasn't happened before. No one was sure what the exact impacts would be other than to be expecting further growth from both fires. What wasn't anticipated was that the inch of stratiform rain with absolutely no lightning actually served to green up the herbaceous fuels above 9,500 feet. The change was evident visually, and it was also evident when you compare the daily acre growth of the 416 fire versus the nearby Burrow fire, which was all at extremely high elevations above 9,500 feet. Here are two stats graphs of ERCG versus ERCY. Um, the ERCY stats graph paints a little less severe run-up of fire season in 2018 than fuel model G, and it also captures the really dry monsoon season we had a lot better. Uh, August 3rd through 7th was a critical fire growth period on another um, nearby fire around here. So I jerry-rigged FS Pro within WFDIS to use ERCY values um, to kind of damp down that initial seasonal severity. Uh, they're not apples to apples. The one on the left goes for seven days and the one on the right goes for 14. Uh, but basically I just use the variance in day-to-day -day ERCY values from a Frisk file and replace those in the ERC stream within FS Pro. And I use the NFDRS 2016 live and dead fuel moisture values from that same Frisk for the ERC classes. 
ERCG average size over seven days was a little over 19,000 acres for one week. ERCY average fire size was uh, 15,700 uh, for two weeks. Here it is with the final perimeter. Uh, ERCY, the ERCY won underpredicted daily acre gains while the ERCG won overpredicted. But the Y1 underpredicted less than the G1 overpredicted. I actually did do this while the fire was going because we were really uncertain of how impactful post-tropical depression bud was going to be and trying to figure out how much risk Purgatory Ski Area was actually facing. ERCG said 40-59% to and ERCY said 5-19%. to ERCY had a smaller mean absolute error than ERCG, um, but both FS Pro's mean average error was within one standard deviation of the mean. The number of data points in this is, is very limited and only seven, so I, I don't know which one of these is more correct. It was just um, trying to test some new stuff on this fire. We're going to go back to Carrie now. So on June 24th, agency administrators requested an FS Pro run that was to be presented the following day at a meeting with representatives from Purgatory Resort to discuss the possibility of reopening Purgatory on July 2nd. An FS Pro analysis was run for seven days beginning 625 using ERCG and showed only a better than 20% probability that the fire would reach control lines already established at the top of the ski area. At a subsequent meeting on June 29th at Purgatory with the District Ranger and Permit Administrator, the NEMO IC and Ops Chief and Purgatory staff there was concurrence that reopening purgatory was worth the risk and the decision was made to reopen the following Monday with restrictions on the movement of people to the south. Purgatory would remain on a pre-evacuation order and could be evacuated and closed again at any time. So here's the Sunday, July 1st, uh, 2254 IR, the night before reopening. and. Uh, Probability we lined up pretty well with uh, actual fire spread over that seven day period. So it was probably gonna be a pretty safe bet to go ahead and open. After the success of direct line construction up to the 171 road, the NEMO team began burnout operations to tie established fire line into con direct control lines along the 171 road. The burnout operations in Division Hotel took five days, burning out in blocks identified by the local unit and fired by local resources using aerial ignition. Pre-existing strong aerial ignition schools were critical in identifying the opportunity and seizing the initiative, rather than waiting for a fire slowing or fire stopping event to hit the inaccessible perimeter. The burnout operations potentially shaved millions of dollars off the final fire cost by reducing the amount of future exposure necessary. The 416 fire had been contained outside the Hermosa wilderness. Here's a picture of the burn blocks, another great strategic plan created and implemented by the local FMO. One to two blocks per day were fired out, and the purple one was never fired out since the fire was essentially boxed in by the time they got to it. The last IR shot was on July 4th. The July 5th IR was UTF due to weather, and the mon monsoons had arrived. Brad? All right, so what was different on this fire, right? It kind of played out really similarly to most of the large, long duration fires that we have out there. But the biggest ones in our eyes are having plans in place preseason and following them. Um, another critical thing we didn't mention is the preseason risk discussions between the fire staff and agency administrators. We talked about decision making uncer un under uncertainty, just like those first few slides that we talked about. And we talked about historically how much we would expect of the San Juan to burn and how much it currently does. Ironically, the average burned area on the San Juan is about 54,000 acres a year if you're looking at the historic range variation. Uh, even with the 416, we're still not close to breaking even. But by discussing this preseason, uh, everybody was primed for the likely event that did occur later in such a way that it wasn't a surprise when it did happen. Because of the preseason work, the typical knee-jerk reactions that happen on fires were kind of muted on the 416. 
Uh, early strategic planning established the scope of the potential strategies and was refined through the trade-off analysis process. And the three IMTs really incorporated strategic planning early, strategic planning early and often. Analytics were used a lot to inform the strategic plan, and most critically, an unacceptable risk wasn't transferred to others to make a decision on. So with that, I'm talking about the direct line construction early on. So that picture Carrie has there is from ICP during one of the uh, downhill crown runs towards Hermosa. The outcomes, uh, there were no structures damaged or lost from the fire. It cost about $730 an acre, which if you look across the valley, um, really isn't that bad. Turning Missionary Ridge into $2018 was about $784 an acre. It also burned down 46 houses and killed one firefighter. So if, we're, if that's our framing, I think the 416 we did pretty darn well on. There were 11 injuries, so the, our rate was 0.05% injury rate, um, which I don't have firm data on, but seems very low. Um, and then really the public bought into that the whole time. So having that strategic plan be out and open, everybody was on the same page. Uh, the public in Durango and Hermosa were just incredibly supportive through the whole incident. Not to say that all the outcomes were good. The flooding that came after the fire was really impactful uh, to residences, businesses, the Hermosa Creek watershed, as well as the Animus River. Uh, Post-fire flooding actually deposited more metals into the Animus River than the Gold King mine spill in 2015. So my takeaway is that I would argue that the improvements in our analytics and strategic planning over the past 16 years saved us approximately $3 million and a whole lot of reduced exposure to firefighters. We knew right off the bat the fire was going to be costly and long duration, but the preseason priming, the effective initial response, the really tempered use of aviation from IA all the way through July 31st when it was called contained, and the early planning on a long duration strategy potentially reduced injuries to a severely low rate and shaved 7% off the final expected cost. So our takeaway uh, lessons learned from all of this stuff, talk to your fire staff and your AAs before the season. Really set them up to understand what is likely to happen and frame it in terms of historically what would have happened before European settlement. Um, explain to them or just discuss with them the risks that everybody's willing to take and discuss with them that we kill firefighters every single year. So what is, what is the worth it for us to do that? Um, again, tie the inevitability of large fires to the historic problems. So you want to frame the problem. And having LTNs and SOPLs uh, in your pocket can really communicate the probability early on and start to lay the good strategic groundwork for the IMT rather than the IMT with everything else they're dealing with having to figure it all out. A sound strategic plan presented early enough can define outcomes through the whole incident. So that's, that's kind of what we had, guys. Um, just wanted to walk you through it from a little more of a strategic angle than really the analysis. The analysis was critical to forming the strategic plan, and we didn't show you the vast majority of that out there. Um, obviously, there were tons of MAPs and all sorts of other plans going on, but just a really basic overview, and I think really focusing in on just how important that preseason conversation can be. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a comment from a listener about um, that refresher trainings are not required for FBENs and LTANs, and just noting that there used to be a fire behavior workshop that was put on in Missoula and, and how that was very beneficial. So thanks for that comment, and, and the uh, Advanced Fire Learning Unit here is taking note of your comment. The next question is, feelings on the direct line construction along the southern line and deviation from the original PACE strategy, um, were the risk trade-offs and the outcomes? So, you know, I don't really see that as a deviation. I see that as kind of seizing the initiative. Um, I was doing SOPL then, so I wasn't working right with the Type 1 team, but Todd Pachota said of that decision that was the easiest one he's ever made because all the hotshot crews, all the divisions, all the ops were all on board with it, and so was the forest. Um, I think having that delaying event, you know, happen in the middle of June where we knew the fire was going to get up and move again, that was absolutely the right call because as that fire continues to move south, it gets back into the warm, dry mix conifer and ponderosa pine, that it was really cranking through even after, um, you know, tropical depression bud in there. So I think that really, um, taking that opportunity really 
sealed off Durango from future impacts combined with the continued burnouts along that 171 road. Um, the issue, initially, if Bud hadn't come, they were going to try a Hail Mary burnout along that road, and their feeling was they couldn't leave anybody on there to hold it. They could only do it aerially. So um, a lot better odds that they had put that direct line in than if they hadn't. It would have been a much different outcome had uh, we not had been visited by the remnants of Hurricane Bud. Okay, we have another question. What was the cause of the 416 fire? I'll take this one, Brad. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, the 416 fire has not been officially declared out yet. So there hasn't been a, uh, a, a official uh, 5,129 individual fire report done, uh, which documents the uh, uh, statistical cause. Um, what we're saying is that at this time it's human caused undetermined. Um, there are litigations pending and until those cases are resolved there won't be a official cause released. Okay, thanks. Let's see, just an, another comment about um, LPANs need to ensure that SBANs are informed on the strategic decisions and briefings. Thanks for that comment. Um, the qu next question is, so often aggressive fire suppression is posed as an argument for shortening the lifespan of a fire and thus reducing firefighter exposure. How was this long-term strategy argued as more favorable for reducing firefighter exposure? Well, so risk is hazard, probability, and value. The value in going direct is always the firefighter. Uh, the probability of them getting hurt up high or down low was vastly different on that. It was a lot closer to one if they were to go direct up there than it was down low where there were ample safety zones. Already existing features that could be more effectively done for, uh, you know, uh, defended. And then also just a lot less time and a lot less reliance on aviation if anybody did get hurt to get them to definitive care. So that, that was what was put out there. I think the reduced exposure can be reflected in that overall injury rate of 0.05%. Um, really, if you look at, you know, firefighter fatalities, which is the only definitive statistic, and then tie it to acres burned, every 100,000 acres burned roughly accounts for 1.4% of all fatalities uh, every year. So you get a 57,000 acre fire that should be roughly 0.7% of all fatalities that occurred. We didn't have that, so that was a good outcome. Now I know that a lot of fires don't have that, but I think the point of that is our data is so limited with regards to injury, cause, location, all of that sort of stuff that it's hard to track these overall rates between strategies. Um, that is a really common argument that's put out there, um, but that would be my counter, is that we, we did it and we had a a very low injury rate doing it that way. Can you explain how the, the PCL, the potential control location, um, was created? Yeah, so that compares uh, past fires against where they stopped on the landscape, whether it was on a road, a ridge, a river, you know, any of what we'd think of as traditional anchor points or if it was a constructed feature. Um, then you use a little machine learning algorithm that I cannot explain because I don't do it. Other people do. Um, and then it just projects into the future, essentially, based on your past fire history and your current landscape, where is a fire likely to stop itself on the landscape, whether it's through suppression or just a natural event or feature stopping it. Um, the PCL and FDI suppression difficulty index, which we didn't get into, I know they're making a national set for that. So I think you're going to be seeing those products a lot more in the future. All right. So how, did the long -term, how did the long-term nature of the fire affect the regional resource availability, availability situation over the duration of the fire? Well, the fire started, it was PL2, so resources were very abundant. Um, you know, in the Northwest, Northern California, and to some extent the Great Basin didn't really pick up till later in July. At that point, the resource needs had really tailed off. Um, even there with the NEMA, we weren't having a whole lot of difficulty getting getting resources till about late June. So that that was another huge benefit we had working for us. 